want to talk a little bit about this corner of Main and Market Street that has truly been the front door to the city of Akron for over 250 years. We know from a diary that was kept by Ohio Moravian missionaries that was published in 1798 that they tell us when the rivers and streams were full in the springtime, the Lenape Indians that they ministered to could canoe from the Big Bend in the Cuyahoga River to the Little Cuyahoga to what is now the base of Howard Street, just down the hill. Now usually we think of the portage path as an eight mile link between the Cuyahoga and Tuscarawas Rivers, but this was a one mile portage and it was imprinted on maps that were familiar both to George Washington and to Thomas Jefferson. This carrying place just down the hill to past this building down to about where Cedar Street is today, where there was a large swamp that connected to the Summit Lake and eventually connected these ancient travelers to the Tuscarawas River. Incidentally, I do have it on good authority that when they passed through the Cuyahoga to the Little Cuyahoga, they stopped play at Valley View Golf Course. <laughs> In 1825, Simon Perkins and Paul Williams founded their little town of Akron centered around the park that's in front of Children's Hospital today, which we call Perkins Square. By 1833, it had about 400 residents. But here at Main and Market, another town had sprung up, developed by Eliakim Crosby, a physician who didn't practice much medicine. He built a two-mile-long mill race, blasted out of bedrock by the Irish laborers who had finished construction of the canal. So now Dr. Crosby's village of Cascade in 1833, centered here at Main and Market, also had about 400 people. But it had 13 retail stores, and he named his city Akron. So there were two Akrons until 1836, when the Ohio legislature granted town status to the two villages that became combined. And just north of here would be multiple mills and factories, including the giant Cascade Mill. There were warehouses built uh, along the mill race between the Ohio and Erie Canal as well. And eventually the mill race was replaced by another canal, the Pennsylvania and Ohio Canal, which ran right down here in front of this building. So in 1840, in the path of what is now Main Street, the Pennsylvania and Ohio Canal made its sweeping turn from East Middlebury to the south, and the lingering effects of that canal still affect us today. You know, the canal had to be 40 feet wide at the top. There was a 10 foot wide towpath and 20 feet of deadfall space on either side so the trees wouldn't block the channel. That is why we have such a very long and very wide main street, which pedestrians still struggle to get across 100 years later today. <laughs> the beginnings of Market Street were as a market. In the wide spot between the Ohio and Erie Canal here to this side and the P.O. and O. Canal out front, farmers brought wagon loads of grain, mostly wheat, and offered it for sale to the canal boats that were headed to the eastern markets. Then in 1847, the grandest hotel in Northeast Ohio was opened on this spot. The Empire House was built by William Burroughs and Judge Lester King and was described as the most modern hotel in Northeast Ohio. There were so many guests at the opening that they actually had to serve food in shifts. The hotel was situated between the two canals. And perched on its roof, right here you can see it, was this cupola, where hotel employees would go to watch for approaching canal boats. In 1851, the Empire House hosted guests attending the National Women's Rights Convention this is the meeting where Sojourner Truth delivered her famous Ain't I a Woman speech at the Universalist Church, which was a block east on North High Street. Most of the women and men who came to Akron to assert their right to vote stayed at the Empire House on this spot here. Now in 1870, across the street, the Academy of Music was built by John F. Cyberling. You know it today as the Everett Building. By 1911, the Empire House had so fallen into disrepute that guests of the rubber companies would actually have to stay at hotels in Canton or Cleveland or Barberton. <laughs> A group of businessmen banded together 
to remedy the shortage of quality hotel rooms, and so they built the eight-story, 170-room Portage Hotel on this spot at a cost of $600,000. It featured 15 round arches trimmed in limestone, punctuated by rusticated coins to the sixth story. Geometric panels created a strong contrast with that dark brown brick. The Akron Times actually put out a special 20-page edition commemorating the grand opening. They marveled at the elaborately decorated living room, uh, I'm sorry, dining room, that uh, was a part of the opening on June 11th of 1912. The spacious lobby had multiple pillars. It was described as a bower of beauty filled with floral arrangements from all over Ohio. In February of 1914, here on this spot, the Akron Rotary was born at a dinner at the Portage Hotel. There were 31 charter members, including news public, uh, newspaper publisher C.L. Knight, grocer Fred W. Albrecht, funeral director George Billow, and a who's who of Akron industry. They had regular luncheon meetings held at the Rotary once a week, and then once a month, the all-male club invited their wives to join them for dinner. <laughs> but the most prominent hotel guest of the 20th century was probably John L. Lewis. His success in organizing the mine workers led him to Akron and the Portage Hotel, where he called together workers at the rubber shops who were feeling very powerless. They would become part of his fledgling Committee for Industrial Organization, the CIO, and the United Rubber Workers Union was founded here on September 12th, 1935. Over 3,000 members were the first to join. The first union in the United States to organize an entire industry. Later, the steel and automotive industries would follow. At the center of a single powerful American industry, John L. Lewis organized workers across company lines into one industrial union and a labor movement was born. For much of the 20th century, the Portage Hotel hosted business travelers and was home to important community events. Its rubber room cocktail lounge was a room entirely constructed of rubber. Guests entered through a rubber door. They walked on rubber tile, sat in seats and chairs that were upholstered in rubber. Drinks were mixed at a rubber bar served on rubber topped tables. The lighting fixtures consisted of six automobile tires mounted on disc wheels suspended from the ceiling, and there were five large murals done entirely in rubber depicting scenes of the industry from the harvest at the plantations to the production of the tire. But, but not everything about the hotel or about Akron was glorious. Akron was a segregated city. Travelers of color were not only discouraged from staying here, but as late as the 1950, were denied rooms at the Portage Hotel. A block north of us, George Matthews built a separate hotel for African American guests, including the great jazz legends of the time. Pioneers such as Cab Calloway, Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald slept at the Matthews Hotel, and the era produced vibrant clubs on Howard Street where jazz musicians could jam and be part of the local music scene. The artist, Miller Horns, designed a monument to the Matthews Hotel, and the history of that era still stands right here, down the street at the corner. One relic that also remains is the building that housed the Ritz Theater, opened in 1949. It showed films appealing to Akron's African-American community, including black cowboy movies and what were called sepia romances. Stage shows with the likes of B.B. King, John Lee Hooker, Della Reese, and many others were put on in this theater behind us, now known as the Interbelt Nightclub. In the 1960s, the Cascade Urban Renewal Project severely changed the shape of all of downtown Akron. A whole city block gave way to construction of Route 59, which we call the Akron Interbelt. Howard Street, between Mill and Markets, was obliterated, taking with it businesses that operated here in the corner outside these windows of the Portage Hotel property. There was a pharmacy that you could enter off of Market Street, and then, of course, the venerable Walsh Brothers Cigar Store for many years operated right here. The Portage Hotel closed in 1969 and reopened as a residential senior living center, which in turn closed in 1978. The decades were not kind to this building, 
In 1987, several investors wanted to spend as much as $10 million to convert the property into apartments, but the plan never came into fruition. Yeah, that's the lobby. And this is when Akron City building inspectors came through with the building's owner, Irvin Applebaum, on a tour of what was now a dangerous place. The inspection was ordered after a piece of sheet metal fell from the top of the building to the sidewalk. So the Portage Hotel was raised in 1992, and the site remained vacant for 10 years. Then in 2000, developer Tony Manna and his Signet Development Company built the new headquarters for our local insurance company, Sumacare. And it opened in 2001. The Sumacare Center was home to 400 employees of the insurance company and 100 employees of Suma's information technology and finance department. In 2004, Sumacare President Marty Hauser wanted to recognize the history of this building. We knew that there had been an Ohio historic marker that was planted on the outside of the old URW building on Mill Street. And no one knew where it was. So eventually, with the help of Doug Wurstler, we found the plaque in the basement of the Goodyear Local 2 Hall. <laughs> we obtained a new historic marker to commemorate the sit-down strike at General Tire in Goodyear, and that day we placed it on Mill Street at the site of the old URW building, uh, which was demolished to make way for the Knight Center. Local trade unions erected a small red brick wall reminiscent of the old URW building, right outside this building, right here to the north, and on it we rededicated that original plaque on a rubber worker's day of commemoration, May 29, 2004. It commemorates the founding of the URW at this place in 1935. The plaza utilizes bricks engraved with the names of URW members, families. There were 400 bricks purchased through the Summit County Historical Society that are in place even today, and the bench in the garden remembered the URW locals number two at Goodyear, number five at Mohawk, number seven at Firestone, and number nine, General Tire. So what does this history matter today? As Akron Public Schools leaves its own historic headquarters on North High Street and celebrates these new gleaming modern offices. Well, I would tell you that I think that place matters. An understanding of place is fundamental to our understanding of livability. The intersection has dominated the history of the community for almost 200 years. This place has been a critical factor and determining the quality of life for the people of Akron and brought with it those social constructs that were uh, shaped by human behavior. This is not just another piece of land. This is a space distinguished by people who lived here, who worked here, by the markets created for trade, by the institutions founded here. The history of this place is very much as important as the physical landscape and the buildings that remain here. Today, the intersection remains Akron's front door, and it's part of the revival of Akron with the renewal of the intersection. There are new neighbors that will be arriving soon, perhaps in the old Northern Ohio Traction and Light Company trolley barn across the street, and the Blue Teak Hotel, the restoration of Akron's own historic district, the Everett Building, the United, the Hermes, and the Nantucket. It's been shaped by millions of people, from Native Americans to technology superstars that have passed through this corner. I like to say that familiar places and familiar buildings are like old friends. They reassure us in times of constant 